The Square Ball Podcast. So, special show today um, with me, Dean Smith. We have Michael Normanton and special guest, Mickey P. Kerr. Hello. So, um, you might know Mickey from Britain's Got Talent or the Bielsa Bible podcast series he did with Rob Mulholland or his comedy nights across the uh, the UK. Um, but he's not here to talk about any of that. You've got a new book out, haven't you, Mickey? Yeah, it's not out yet. It's been written. It's actually been printed right now and it's due for release in December through Repeater Books, December the 2nd. So, basically, I've come on here to try and get some pre-order links yes but it is very topical um, at the minute and it is is absolutely in the heart of football and league united itself it's called football the people's shame how to revolutionize a national sport correct where did this idea come from uh i've been writing this book for like three years bielsa is a big thing uh in this book you know the inspiration and and just the idea of thinking differently really um i kind of realized that football the politics of football which no one understands it seems to be exist under this veil of invisibility, really, because we don't know the journey that football's gone on. We understand it and feel it, but we don't un- we, we don't know what it is. So I just had a, a hunch, researched it, and then realised if you reverse the macroeconomic structure, that sounds really abstract, I know, but you come out with football as a public service. So I'll stand by this claim. This is the greatest political idea of the 21st century. Wow. I stand by that claim. I'm, I'm hoping to back it up. Well, I was going to say, let's back it up then. So the book is in three parts, correct? That's correct. And we're going to touch on the first couple today, yeah. just to kind of give a bit of an intro. So the first uh, the first part of the book is basically the history of English football, mm-hmm. right? Um, how it is, is transferred from community sport into globalised commercial products. Um, talk us through that then. Talk us through this, this first part. Yeah, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll quickly say that... Um, football as football fans we think short term it's very tribal and we think small we think our own club's bubble and we've been doing that you know it's naturally what you do as fans and and there's you know that's a good thing but as a result of that no one's looking at the bigger picture we've taken our eye off the bigger picture and it's changed significantly so what i'm going to try and explain here is how you think long term and how you think big because it's important we do that because football as it was isn't as it is now and really this is an intergenerational defeat we've been dispossessed gradually over the last probably four decades and i think we're losing a war that we're not fighting and the idea of this book is to is is to it's a fight back basically it's it's a platform for a, a debate that doesn't exist yet as in what do you want football to be no one's ever asked us that as fans we don't have there's there's no democracy in english football it's very authoritarian um, foreign ownership, you know, it, it's become, instead of a community sport like it was, it's become this globalised product that is that is owned by, well, the rest of the world, not even us anymore. So how do we fight back? And, uh, you know, part two explains, well, part two is the fight back, how we how we can do it. And part one, like I said, just explains the political process of, 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 Engl- of English football's journey. Should we, should we try it? Give sure. it a go. Sure, let's, let's try go. it. Like I said, this is the first time I've ever done this, so thanks. That I've not been on any podcasts yet, so <clears throat> I've had to go from writing a book now to explaining a book. So if I, you know, trip over myself or anything like that, I said to you earlier off the mic, I'm a bit nervous about doing this, so hopefully I, I can get it right, you know. Uh, but we'll see. I've got some notes, but they're not very good. Uh, I'm not happy with them, but hopefully it'll just keep us on track somehow. So... Uh, how did English football go from being this kind of the people's game into the people's shame? You know, the, it, you never hear the people's game anymore. No, it, it used to be called the people's game because I think subconsciously we all know it isn't. So basically, first of all, what I want to do is explain the Victorian regulation because that's how football was and that's what was handed down to us. And I d- don't dismiss this as being like naive or not fitting for the modern age because it totally is. It's, it shares a similar ideology to the Americans, actually. So how they govern and manage sport now. So basically, it was. It took them a few decades, well, about 15 years to get it all in place. They let free markets reign for a bit, but then they realised it wasn't working. So what, what the Victorians did was they saw football as a sport, not a business. And that's a really important distinction to make because now it's a business before it's a sport, really. Um, they realised that fair competition, sport and integrity, uh, community relations were key. So they built a system around that. 
Okay, so <clears throat> football's got a business side to it, but that business side is strictly controlled and regulated. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is a piece of regulation called Rule 34. I doubt you'll have heard of it. Okay, have you heard of it, Michael? I have, but only because I've looked it up because ah. of this. Okay, David Conn is the man for this, great football journalist. He's done a lot of work on Rule 34. Rule, so in, when football was first professionalised, 1885, um they wanted to turn football clubs into there's got you know, a lot of a lot of people are going big gate receipts you've got the start of a business model they wanted to expand infrastructure but they wanted to de-risk that by forming public uh limited companies right so you don't you know if it all goes wrong it's the company that takes the loss so okay they said yeah fine but you've got to they, they implemented rule 34 as well so they weren't just standard operating businesses rule 34 meant you can't take profits out of football clubs shareholders cannot take profits out so essentially, the, the non-profit organisations and the run for the community. So Rule 34 uh, uh, was still in the FA handbook in the, in the 1990s. It's obviously not been adhered to now, but it's never been repealed. So Rule 34 was essential. They had a wage cap and they shared gate receipts as well. So it's very egalitarian. You know, it's any part of the country could win. And you've got teams like Burnley won it in the 20s, three times on the trot. Teams like Wolverhampton Wanderers have won it as well. So and it, it felt like, or it, it basically was the case, that it was very fair, very equal, and the economics uh, made that happen. You know, that, that's how football was. Uh, we don't see that today. So how did football change? Football changed because the wider political uh, landscape changed. The key decade is the 1970s. So in 1970, oil is cheap, unemployment's low. By 1980, it's reversed. Oil is expensive, unemployment's high. Uh, there's a Middle Eastern oil crisis in the in the mid-70s, and it just impacted this country hugely. We went down to a three-day week. We couldn't afford enough oil to run the economy. People still talk about the winter of discontent. That was 1978. The country's in dire need of reform. <clears throat> the economic consensus of the post-war era was Keynes, Keynesianism, like kind of big state, everything's nationalised. And that's where the change happens because it's not worked. We need change. In comes neoliberalism. It's the opposite of Keynes. It's, it's, I won't go into the economic theorist's name. We, it's just a case of deregulation, privatisation um, and big business and individualism instead of this collective collectivism and state control, basically. So that's that happens in the late 70s. In 79, Thatcherism comes in, Thatcher's um, prime minister, and you've got this switch. That switch affected football. So we know about 1992. Everyone knows about 1992, Premier League era. That's not the economic hinge point. That's not where it changed. And I, I'll, I'll reference this later, but... That economic change, that actually, it's a revolution, Premier League, in football in terms. It didn't happen in a vacuum. It, it took about 10, 15 years to lay the political foundations for the Premier League. And it started in the late 70s with the failure of Keynesianism. So <clears throat> the key year in football, English football, is 1983. That's the most important year. Nine years before the Premier League. What's so special about 1983? First of all, it's the first time that you've got regular broadcasting. So you've got the duopoly, BBC and ITV. They're now pumping money in. You've got regular football being aired weekly. Okay, so what you've got is money coming into the industry. You've got this political shift, this economic shift in towards individualism, and you've got rich people, shareholders of football clubs thinking, hmm, you know, there's money here now. We want this money. So that's the first thing. You've got... You've got broadcasting technology and advancement in technology that's it impacts football massively it still does now uh 1983 you've also got you see this economic change this this, this ideology is changing the sharing of gate receipts is is stopped so clubs no longer share gate receipts so we're seeing this individualism we're seeing this the bigger teams are wanting more for themselves but uh 1983 is probably most significant because that's the first time rule 34 was bypassed so that's when it happened remember rule 34 protected football clubs from um people taking money out you know and also as well if you liquidated a club all the money went to charity so it's, yeah, it's completely different um uh, ideology who did it irving scholar he was the spurs chairman before sugar he, he wrote to the fa 
<clears throat> he said, I don't want to do Rule 34. I want to abandon it. They didn't bother to respond. So he went ahead with a commercialization process of taking money out of the club. He did it by setting up a holding company tethered to the parent company. The parent company is Spurs. The money goes into the holding company. It doesn't leave Spurs. It goes into the holding company, which is tethered to the uh, you know, parent company. But guess who owns the holding company? So that's how they got around the regulations. So it's, it's and this um, holding model, comp, uh, model then becomes the new norm. No one knew about this. This is all happening behind the scenes. So Irving Scholar, who Spurs were the first to, you know, spark, uh, spark, I say sparked the revolution, he really did. They were the first to float on the stock exchange, stuff like that. So you've now got footballs becoming business orientated, you, you know, for want of a better phrase. So 1983 is really key. Um, and what we see as well, let's refer to my notes, I've, I've gone off here. Um, so yeah, basically, just to summarise, technological advancements and the wider political landscapes changed and, and that laid the foundations for a cultural shift in English football. That's one towards big business and one towards commercialism. So we've got this, the idea of individualism and and, on all, and the wider political landscape, again, is changing, shifting. You've got the, uh, you know, eight, 1989, I think the Berlin Wall falls. It's the end of communism. It's the, the capitalism. It's the end of history. People were saying it's this dawn of a new era. All that's playing a role. You've also got Hillsborough as well. That's huge. English football's in desperate need of reform. You know, it's the, the, the foundations for the Premier League have just been forged in this perfect storm. You've got an inquiry... Um, that said, you know, football grounds have got to become all seater. Um, and then actually the Labour, you had the football pools, you remember those, they were like gambling, form of gambling. They were, um, they, they had about £250 million a year were coming through the football pools. Um, the Labour government were the opposition. They said that we should use the pool money, pools money, to, to you know, uh, build these stadiums, seats. And but they, But they said, no, 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 football clubs need to build them themselves. And they can do that by... Um, new broadcasting deals. Uh, 1990 World Cup is massive in English football because it's the first time Murdoch sees the country's passion for English football. And he's in massive debt, is Murdoch. Sky has got cinema services. He's in, you're talking billions in the late 80s, early 90s. So he takes a punt on, on English football. He sees the 1990 World Cup. He goes, wow, 25 million people tune into that semi-final defeat. Still remember it. Um, like it was yesterday, to be fair. What a great World Cup. Shit football, but I never remember that. You know, it was such a great World Cup. It was, anyway, but Murdoch's not the pioneer. It's Berlusconi's the pioneer. The, the uh, Italia, he was, doing the, he was doing the broadcast in Italy from the 80s, from, from 1980, actually. And uh, you remember that, um, you know, when Gaza went to Lazio and stuff, all that predates the Premier League. So, um, uh, as well, <laughs> just to throw in a bit more politics, um, Kinnock was going to become, he was a hot favourite for the um, Prime Minister position in 1992, but he lost. He was threatening to take Murdoch to the Monopoly Commission because this new idea of Sky TV, it's a monopoly. You're not allowed to do that. 1965 is the Act of Parliament. You know, you're not allowed to get monopolies. <clears throat> but John Major said, no, don't worry about it. You know, we'll sort you out. So Murdoch went heavily in favour of the Tories and they won that surprise election, you know, with all his, his newspapers and uh, but then he, he totally fucked the Tories over in 97 and went to Blair. So, you know, that's that's Murdoch for you. But anyway, that, that's how it's set up. And then I want to take up very, you know, very basic details. I want to talk about monopolisation now because this the gap between the best and the rest is just accelerating faster than ever. This has been 40 years in the making. But since 1992, let's talk about it because no one's looking at this bigger picture. We can all feel it. But this is what the bigger picture says. So in, it was just over £60 million pounds in 92, 93 went to the Premier League teams. None of it went to the rest of the pyramid, all up to the top, all of it. It was the big six was a bit different back then. It was Liverpool, Everton, uh, Spurs, Arsenal and Man United. So Everton, they, they, were, they, they were really a big part of the Premier League. They wanted they, these, these broadcasting deals, they wanted all the money. Uh, and that happened uh, 30 years later in 22... 2022, sorry, that figure's gone from 60 million to three over 3 billion. So that's a 5,000% increase in 30 years. And all the money's going straight up to the top. 
1993 and in 1994, newly promoted teams to the Premier League finished in third place. You just couldn't think of that happening now. So the gap, it's like I said, the gap between the best and the rest has, has widened. Last time any team newly promoted finished in the top five was, was Ipswich Town. That was 2001. I mean, that's not going to happen this year. You can guarantee it. So the, the monopolisation process, you, I think it reveals itself best <clears throat> in the number of points won by Premier League winners. So I did some... No one's done this research. I had to do it myself. Let's split the Premier League into three decades. We're in the fourth decade now. The first 10 years, the second 10 years, and the third 10 years, you could win the title on 81 points in the first 10 years. That's the average. In the second 10 years, it goes to 87. And in the third 10 years, it goes to 91. Um, Leicester City had a glitch. I don't know why it happened. 2015, 2016, they finished the season on 81 points. And they won it quite comfortably as well. So for whatever reason, the, monop- the, the process failed. Don't know why it faltered. But in the seven seasons after that, the average points tally is 94. So you can see it's just going up and up and up. It should be 95, but the season before last, City had won the title with two games left and they played Calvin. <laughs> they dropped five points. So, you know, I love Calvin, by the way. I mean, it, it, you know, we, we can talk about Calvin a bit later and Leeds United youth players and what's happening to them. It's all part of the bigger picture. Basically, all the best players in the world, all the best coaches in the world have been sucked into about 10 or 12 teams. And we can feel that. We can see that. And it's happening faster and faster and faster. Just for context, do you remember the Kevin Keegan rant, 96, 97? Mm-hmm. They were in the, it was a four-horse title race, that. Um, Newcastle finished on 68 points. Man United pulled up the way. They won the title on 75 points. Just incredible. You wouldn't even get third place with that now. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the year after that, Wenger won it for the first time on 78. Then Man United, Champions of Europe, 1999. Won it on 79 points. You, you, I mean, Man City got 100. Liverpool didn't even win it on 97. So you can just see it. The, the, the gap, I keep saying this phrase, but the gap between the best and the rest is widening all the time. You can see it in the FA Cup since my first football in memory is 88. The crazy gang beat Liverpool 1 0 in the final. In the 36 seasons since then, the top, the big six, we know who they are. They've won it on 90% of the occasions. Same in the EFL Cup since 2004, Middles, Middles, Middlesbrough's victory. It's 90% again. It's 18 out of 20. It's the big six. And the same for the European Cup in the 80s before the Champions League. Stal Bucharest won it. Romanian club, you know. Forest won it. Hamburg SV, I think they're called. Quite an obscure German team won it. In 1990, Red Star Belgrade won it. But since the European... Champions League, 1992, it's 75%, well, it's over that now, of of of, um, of all trophies have been won by seven teams. And they're just the seven teams in the top four leagues. So the idea that an obscure team or, you know, an underdog can win is, is out the window now. And like I said, it, this is accelerating. It's becoming more and more extreme. So <clears throat> we, we we've just completely... As fans, you know, un- this is the process. This is what's happening. We're completely powerless. We're just serfs. And there is no democracy at all in English football. Um, and I think there's sometimes the, the illusion of soft power, but there's no hard power. And I'll, we can see it in Leeds, actually. Remember when the club changed tact on, on the torso badge, Leeds mm-hmm. salute thing? The power of the collective was victorious. We won out on that. But there were no financial incentives. So then a f- um, three, I think three years later in 2021, I'm trying to get a, uh, a this this book started out as a presentation. It's changed radically since then in three years. But I was trying to get a date with the LUSC Trust Foundation. And they, they weren't, you know, they were being a bit like, oh yeah, let's do a presentation to them. And then Chile's, I think that cryptocurrency came in. We all went mental. Everyone's complaining about it, rightly so. It's, you know, it's gambling, unregulated. Um, and the, did the club relent and apologise? No, I think actually I remember um, Angus coming here, doubling down. So when there's profit involved, the, the moral compass is dropped and the total authority of the dictator is exercised because that's what this is. It's a dictatorship. So like if, if we think about 
I mean, this, this is fascinating, mate. If we think about this as a, in, in the kind of the briefest terms, is it that we as football fans have taken our collective eyes off the ball? Absolutely. Our eyes off the prize. We're, yeah. we're so concerned with what's going on yeah. over there at Ellen Road, down the mm -hmm. way at Thor Park. Same with any Tranmere Rovers, I just worried about Tranmere Rovers, that we can't, we haven't seen the storm that's been gathering around us and taking us off in a completely different direction. I think what's happening is that this commercialization agenda of English football has affected English football and culture. Mm. We ourselves are beginning to, we are becoming commercialized zombie consumers rather than active football supporters. And those who do support their club with like a spiritual element, you know, loyal, passionate supporters, we're the ones that have been fucked over here. Football is, you know, its popularity is expanding, but a lot of people, there's, there's new research um, to show like, Football fandom in 2021, this came out, this data. One in five people don't have a club. So uh, there's there's loads of different ways. Like people love the stats side of things. People love the uh, the game changes, the call, the way that football relates to politics. Like people like Marcus Rashford taking a stance, that inspires them. A lot of them are socialisers, which means they just enjoy football. It gets people together and forms friendships. They go to the pub to watch the games. They're not that interested in the loyal connection that, are, you know, that we're, we're described as lifers. I think I think Leeds United is, is a little bit insulated from that because we haven't been in the Premier League for a lot of this period. So you, you can see it though in, in the stadiums that the, it's consumers, it's not supporters. But, and as well, like it, it, we, we've been talking on the show recently about this idea of business. Yeah. And selling Archie Gray, selling Jorginho, that is such a bitter pill to swallow. And the only way that you can swallow it is going, well, it's business. Like we have to do this to survive. Mm -hmm. And I guess with what you're proposing and, and the idea of what football used to feel like before these changes happened was that we wouldn't swallow that. We would be able to stand up or we'd be able to see the wood for the trees a bit better and say, oh, well, hold on a minute. These are our players. This this is this is Archie fucking Gray. He's a Gray dynasty. It's our heritage has been washed down the toilet. Yeah. And it feels like Harry's going to go the same way, who's supposedly even better than Archie. If he's any good, he'll be gone at 18. Mm. It's almost like with Archie, I was, I was praying that he'd be a little bit shit <laughs> so we could keep him. Yeah. You're, lucky, you're lucky if you get a play to 18 these days, aren't you? Because yeah. the, the, I mean, the changes they made around academy, look at, look at academies. Gildar. We got him at 16. Yeah. And you get, you get people who, like Man City, um, will come in and get your best 13, 14, 15 year olds. They don't wait until they're 18. They don't wait until they've played, had a sniff of the first team because they know at that age, they can pay, like Finlay Gorman, they can pay a million or two and a million or two to them, absolutely nothing. And then he goes into their youth system along with another 30 players who they've poached from West Brom, from Sunderland, from all over the country. And yeah. it just, it focuses all talent in one place. But once, they become, once they're at Man City, you're lucky if one or two of those pops through every couple of years. Well, you look at the business model, it's similar to what there used to be music. If you sign 50 kids, right, for a combined cost of 70 million, if one of them turns out to be the player you want him to be, you've made your money back. Mm. So it, it's a good business strategy to do that. The, the problem we've got is that the is is football's intellectual foundations are completely wrong, and that's what we need to change. This is systemic. And by the way, you know Brighton are taking our players, but if if Jorginho, I mean, I absolutely love Jorginho. By the way, I'm, I'm really sad to see him go. Him and Archie is just a real blow. It's, it, it really upsets me. Um, at more, more so Archie for obvious reasons. If he turns out to be brilliant and that player that we, you know, you see glimpses of, this so arrogant, so good on the, so strong, the way he can turn players. <clears throat> if he can do that in the Premier League, Brighton won't keep him. They can't. Mm. There's a hierarchy here. And if he goes to Spurs, that's the bottom of the top six. You know, if someone does really well like Gareth Bale, you ain't keeping him. There's a, it's all getting sucked up. And that's what you've got to remember. There's, there's no loyalty in terms of anything else but money. And money is the new god. Money and success in terms of there's only a few teams that can win. So if you want to be any good, you've got to play for them. Yeah, what you were saying then through that that first um, part of your, of your book, it just feels like that fairness is being stripped out and yeah. it, and fans are being ignored by by this fairness being being stripped out. And it also sounds like this this process where... Um, things changed, and uh, the you were able to to find a way to get shareholders to pocket some cash. It just sounds like Ken Bates' wet dream, and it sounds like this is where he exactly. came alive and thought, "This is I, I can work in football now." But it's a slow process. 
It's, hmm. hap- it's happened over decades, and now it's all in place. So it, it's really accelerating. The European Super League is here in everything but name. It is hmm. happening. The economics are telling. When you look at the journey, it has to happen. And eventually, English clubs will have to join. And who owns the English clubs? Well, four of the big six are owned by American businessmen, and they are chomping at the bit, contrary to what they might suggest, to get this over the line. We have no say, absolutely no say, in the governance of English football. Powerless serfs, you have no say. Your voice does not matter. Going on pub, going on social media and, and saying your opinion is it, it, worthless. Even if all of us decided this is what we want, it's not. It's a dictatorship. You, the FA, the Premier League, they tell us what how it is. So, so let, let's move on to part two. How do we fix football? Yeah, this is it. So, first of all, I'm going to just... It's really obvious to say this, but I have to talk the different intellectual foundations. The, the, so at the minute, football is, is based on authoritarianism, over-commercialisation, individualism and monopolisation. That's what we've seen. So instead, we're going to shift towards democracy, community relations, sporting integrity and collectivism. Now, collectivism can spark fears in people's minds because you think of oh, communism. Well, I'm going to debunk that straight away and deal with it here right now. A lot of the ideas that I've got I've imported from America the US see sport like the Victorians did sport first business second so if you're going to accuse me of being a communist you need to accuse the Americans of being a communist which is a complete non-starter this is the sporting realm okay it's not the wider economy I, I, th- this is why I think this idea is so good I've, I, I, I've labeled it quantum politics because it's left wing and right wing and centrist all at the same time what we're going to do is ring fence the football sector, keep it separate from the rest of the economy. We're going to reverse engineer neoliberalism and then we're going to take the wider manufacturing related to football. We're going to collectively own that as well. And we're going to fund football as a collectively owned public service. So this is systemic change. You've got to think systemic change. Syst- the problems are systemic. So like the Crouch Report came out, it's a diversion. It doesn't doubt the validity of privatisation and free market economics within the sporting realm. Even the Americans don't do that. Why are we doing it? It's ridiculous. It's not working. There's also a way of protecting English football as a global brand and actually enhancing it because we need that if we're going to run this as a successful public service. But first problem, right? We've got private owners. Our football clubs are owned by private individuals. So... There is a way. This is the way you do it. State intervention. You do it through acts of parliament. So the European Court of Human Rights is an international treaty. It's been part of UK law since 1998. And that protects migrants, gives them human rights, but it also protects the rich. Not many people think about that. You can't just take someone's property, but you can You can take someone's property. There are two, this is what what the European Court of Human Rights says in the cases of nationalisation, which is what I'm suggesting. You've got to do it legally, Acts of Parliament, and you've got to do it in the public interest. It's got to be in the public interest. And the the law actually states, it's all in the book, this, I'm not going to go into it too detailed, but you give, this is a legal term, you're given a wide margin of appreciation for deciding what is in the public interest. It's weighted towards the state. There's another stipulation as well. You've got to give these dispossessed claimants market value for their property. You've got to pay them. I'm going to give you an example. HS2, okay, is a a railway line from London to Birmingham. Uh, It was supposed to go to the north, but obviously it doesn't. Uh, It's been, the contracting has been absolutely terrible. It's, It's coming in at 70 billion at the minute, okay, which is, and it's constantly rising, this figure, but I want to have £70 billion. People have been in the way of that railway line. Their houses are down in the way. What the state does is it takes the house off them, says it's in the public interest. Here's loads of money for your house. You know, probably, and, and, and you're forced to move. There was a shipping company in the UK before the great switch from Keynesden to Milton Friedman in, the, in 1974, a really profitable shipping company. It was, it was nationalised. The people who owned it didn't want, didn't, they were making good money. But it was, it was taken off them by 78. It took four years through the courts. It was nationalised. These things do happen. The state nationalises stuff. Usually when a, a business is bankrupt, it's like we nationalise the banks. But you can do it when a business is profitable. So 
you do it through state intervention. You've got to pay them for it. I mentioned the HS2, 70 billion. I want to talk about the Elizabeth line. It's a new part of London's sprawling network uh, of transport system. That was 22 billion. So have those two figures in mind. You can, you can buy every single football club in England for a combined cost. Market valuations are, it's not a set price. It can vary. It can vary. But the, it's between 25 and 30 billion. So you can buy every, we'll go top end. Let's call it 30 billion. You know, if you got them for 25, it's two thirds the price of track and trace. A fucking spreadsheet that costs 37 billion. What I'm doing here is showing you the, the power of state spending. Football's really, really culturally significant. And it's economically tiny at state level. It's really vulnerable to political takeover and nationalisation. It doesn't cost much. So, you know, Liz Truss offered the energy companies 130 billion. That's a fucking lot more than 30. So state spending, football is really, really cheap. And you can take it without needing to negotiate with any owners. You can just take it. This relies, pop it relies on popular support, but I've talked earlier about building the foundations. This could take 10 years. It could take 15 years. It can be done by 2029 depending on how, how, and I'll tell you now, the wider economic landscape is shifting. The way this, this you know, it's gone wrong. The, there is a, the wider political landscape is fertile ground for revolution, just like it was in the 70s, it is again now. So let's talk about the next thing. If we spent as a state 30 billion pound, it's a big outlay. We can afford it because what else we're going to do is take broadcasting in to public ownership. Broadcasting has been done really badly. At the minute, the Premier League just sells the rights and various buyers around the world in their region buy it up, they market the products and they sell it to their customer base. <clears throat> 200 million people. And by the way, broadcasting is really easy to take over. You just wait for the end of a cycle. You get it for free. Um, 200 million people around the world pay more than 30 quid a month to watch Premier League football. If you, if you charge them all £10 a month, that's £24 billion a year. You've got to do it from a single digital broadcasting network. You've set up a digital platform that's capable of giving Premier League football through the internet to the rest of the world. Amazon have already done this. So the, the technology works. It's already there. In 2019, Amazon, and they did a good job, really good job. That's the, is that, that's the digital age. Football transferred from the satellite age into the digital age, and it went really well. And the technology is only getting better. The MLS, it's happening. Apple in bed with the MLS they are now doing this singular digital network this singular digital broadcasting service to the rest of the world if the Premier League do it it's also harder to hack you can't really hack Amazon or Netflix and so it'll be with our if I call it PLTV yeah Premier League TV whatever we're going to call it you, that 200 million people 10 pound a month you could double that Five, 600 million are watching the big games that's our customer base that's what if we can get 500 million people to pay ten pound a month, you know, it's it's uh, is it sixty billion pound a year? So this is the potential here. But let's stick with that two hundred million. Let's pretend that it stays there. Twenty four billion pound a year it costs about five hundred million to run. Premier League wages between three and three and a half billion. What do you want to do with twenty billion pounds? This is the and um, did Britain? I might I might be going a bit off piece here, but we have no digital tech infrastructure at all. We are completely reliant on... Do you remember Microsoft had a little glitch a couple of weeks ago? Half mm -hmm. the country shut down. We're reliant completely on US web servers. But we don't have any of our own digital tech. Okay, there's a great book, I read it recently, called um, Vassal State by a guy called Angus Hampton. And it describes how... Well, I've just said we have no digital... We're owned by America. We're owned completely... Everything's American-owned. Even HP Source is American-owned. It's all behind the scenes. We don't have any of our own digital tech. So what a great opportunity to get some. We can build our own tech. Britain shall rule the waves once again, rule Britannia, but the digital waves. Now, off the back of this, we can get a social media company as well, our own collectively owned social media company. And this is a, a, such an obvious thing to think about that no one's ever suggested. Denise Coates owns Bet365. She's worth over $8 billion and she shares um, that company with a two brothers so they're you know it's equal weight and you've got tw tens of billions of pounds in 20 years why don't we just set up a public gambling company 
And we've got the digital tech infrastructure there again. Bang, you just use a website. It's dead easy. You know, you mimic and imitate any innovations in the sector that the private companies are doing, and you just stick it in the private realm and allow it to compete. So every time you lose, the house wins. We are the house. It's a great idea. I think it's about 16 billion a year gambling. It's a big, big business. It's all going offshore. You know, at least Denise Coates paid herself 400 million. She taxed that, to be fair to her. We could just tax it ourselves. We can, in fact, don't even tax it. Just have it. We will own that gambling company. We will own all the profits. It all goes, it all goes back into football as a public service. What else do you do at football? You drink. Let's get a public brewery set up. So it could be one giant brewery, or it could be loads of micro breweries connected to clubs. But the idea is that when you scan the taps on match day, you know that that lager or that bitter or whatever it is pays back into football. You know. And if you own the broadcasting, you can you decide what is advertised. We could advertise our brewery products to an international market of 200 million people, start expanding into this. What about the gambling company? The same. So it's a great opportunity to own a huge manufacturing sector collectively. I'll talk about the model of ownership in a bit. Um, it won't be owned by the state. The idea is this. The state will use the state as a lever to buy football and hand over rights to us. It's perfectly possible there's a new model of ownership um, by Keir Milburn, a Leeds fan, and him, him and Bertie Russell, it's called a public commons partnership. But there's one more thing about this country that we're struggling with. We, we've got a trade deficit, which means we export hardly anything and we import everything. So you can't really run a national economy on debt-ridden consumers, which is what we are. <clears throat> you need good manufacturing. So the idea of taking football, manufacturing it ourselves and exporting it is going to help with that trade balance. And there's one more thing as well. We've got shirt replication, you know, shirt rep, replica shirt manufacturing, should I say. It's, you know, Nike, Adidas, Umbro, whatever it might be. Kick them all out. We'll make the shirts ourselves. We'll have a little logo. And, and Adidas and Nike, yeah, they can be involved, but each club will do their own deals with them. At the minute, you get 20% of your shirt at best. 20% of the prop, that's it. So, we'll, so Nike and Adidas will not make any English football shirts. We'll make them ourselves. We'll do it here in the UK. We'll do it as non-profit to keep costs down. But we'll also have to put some offshore into cheaper regions, you know, Asia, really. But that gives us quite a lot of geopolitical leverage. You know, do you want five factories? That's 5,000 jobs. Particularly in China, they're struggling at the minute for jobs. It gives us leverage. We own the rights to everything. That's the idea. You do it through state intervention. You do it through popular support. Um, and yeah, let me talk about the model of ownership before we take a little break because I'm, I'm worried about con cognitive overload, which is teaching too much. But it's important that we this this aptly inspired nationalisation that happened in the post-war period. The state owned everything, you know, NHS. It's not that model. There's a new model called a public commons partnership, as I mentioned earlier. Basically, the state owns a small percentage, and we own ninety percent, say. So it's weighted. It's not this 49-51 you have in Germany. It's far more weighted in our, in our favour. Um, the the managed in a way that there's three different democratic, democratic fora, as it said. There's the local authority, there's the common association, which would be paying members us, and the joint enterprise. The local authority, public commons partnerships will be merged with councils. So football clubs will be merged with councils. And it's not that the fact that the council tells us what to do. It's often this far away bureaucracy that, that makes shit decisions will influence the council for things like land purchases we can get them quick and easy because we will influence the council uh, the joint enterprise is a body of experts so each public common partnership will, will be managed by a body of relevant experts in that specialist field and also the common association as well so there's three there's three ways that they might basically it's, it's democratic we can decide everything but we're getting expert advice and we've got the government on side so it's this new model of ownership. And by the way, this manufacturing company is a huge public commons partnership. I'm going to talk about membership payments now. It's a huge public commons partnership. It's one of the biggest corporations in the UK. It's owned by us. It gives us political lobbying power over our own government, central government. A lot of lobbying now is by corporations. We'll own one of the biggest corporations. So it's a way of, of, of changing the national economy as well to give ourselves more power and more political clout and more democracy to local regions um, membership payments, football clubs. First of all, you'll pay one pound a month to own the huge 
public commons partnership that involves a, a huge international broadcasting company, a gambling company, a social media company, shirt manufacturing around the world, brewery, an international brewery, why not? Um, you know, everything I've just talked about, you'll pay one pound a month. Okay, I, I imagine we'd have somewhere in the middle of 20 million members, you know, because it is in your interest to own this corporation. You'll also pay £10 a month to own your football club. So you're part of a local and national body. So it's £11 a month. £10 a month, this is, you, there's, no, there's no sponsorship at all in English football under this model. You don't need it. I mean, I suppose with a city like Leeds, we'd be looking at trying to get half a million people to try and pay in, you know, £10 a month is a lot of money. But we're going to give away 10% rights to foreigners. So they will pay £1 a month. I'm going to use Man United because, they're, as the example, they're supposedly the biggest club in Britain. Um, as it Liverpool or Man United, really, isn't it? They've apparently got 650 million fans worldwide. If 500 million of those paid one pound a month, that's six billion a year into Man United. So you, you can. This is huge money. We could do quite well on this as well. It's huge money. And what do you get? They get some ownership rights. They get to regular email correspondence. They get to vote on certain issues with the club. But you have genuine hard power. Limited, of course, because we'd be the major shareholders. And um, and they'd also get included in our social media site as well. So it'd be invite only. No one's anonymous. Um, and our data is protected, more importantly. And you're not getting advertised to. Um, so there, that that's the model. Uh, if Basically, the idea is this. I'm looking back and I'm, I'm saying to... So everybody, listen, these Victorians, they were real optimistic people. They, this Britain uh, football was codified at the height of imperialism. 1863 was the FA's first meeting, you know, where they decided the rules of football and rugby split and became its own, its own sport. The, these people, were, they, were, they had ambition. And I, I think we, we're in a state of decline here. Britain's in a massive state of decline. And that's also in our psyche as well. We've lost our empire. You know, losing our football clubs is just another step forward in this declinist process. We've got to reverse that. I'm saying optimistic. Listen, we could go out there with a new a multinational company collectively on a new form of capitalism um, and not just make it morally conscious, make it moral. Um, there's so much more I could talk about, but... I'm quite exhausted. If you, I <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say, so, so I mean, it's, it's it's genuinely fascinating, mate. Like, where do I sign up? Like, the idea of of getting our football club back working for and with us sounds sounds. Yeah, fabulous. we would. It would be owned by us. And so the idea there is is to is to put the fans back at the heart of the club and yeah. not just as cash cows that we keep coming I, through the gates. I, I, th I think we need to think bigger than club. We need to think about club, uh, the football and culture yeah, and course. the way that the whole system's governed and, and make it more about, I, mean, I can talk about some regulation I've got. I've got an idea of how to, reg basically we, what we want, I've built it and I'll, I might be in my notes for this just one sec. I've, I've got an idea for how we can, four guiding principles, right, for regulating and governing English football. Number one, create profit. The idea of debt is ridiculous, but we've all become so used to it. It's just a, a normal thing in football. No, it's not. Debt's ridiculous. You don't need debt. Create profit, ensure world-class players sign for English clubs, right? That, that's essential because without world-class players, we ain't got that 200 million, et cetera, um, fan base, have we? Encourage homegrown talent. You know, we talked about Archie before. And promote fair competition and sporting integrity. I think I think if you do those four guiding principles: profit, fairness, um, world class players, and local players. So what you do is this: you've got to implement a wage cap. There's no way around it. You've got to have a ceiling on spending limit. You've got to have a ceiling on spending. Sorry, because if we spent a billion on wages and won the league, then Man United would spend two billion on wages. It would just go. That's what that is inevitable hyper wage inflation is inevitable in free market economics you've got to you've got to control it the victorians controlled it the americans control it but how do you stop that happening in europe let's say if we if we win the league and mm. our wage cap is a billion and real madrid go well we want all the best players in the world so our wage cap is 2 billion how does that how do you stop that happening i'll show you how you do it first of all you keep the wage bill really high so at the minute it's about 3.5 billion i've raised it to 5.5 so every club gets 200 million and 75 million for spending transfer kit. They can also spend, and this is key, this is from America again, three players outside the wage cap. It's called the designated player rule. It's what they used to sign David Beckham, Galaxy at LA Galaxy in 2007. So you've got a wage cap, it's incredibly high. 
you limit squads. Um, in, a, in the MLS, it's 30. So I've said 30 and then three outside that wage cap. We're paying the highest wages by miles anyway. We're way ahead of everyone. So I've upped it. I think the average wage of the Premier League players is about three million. I've upped it to six. I've pretty much doubled it. And then you can sign three players outside. You look at those commercial, each club, it's got its, uh, there's a central source, just like in the MLS, that supplies everyone with the money. But you've also got, each club's got its own independent commercial operations as well. So you didn't, we, we could make deals with Nike and Adidas for nice jackets or whatever. We've also got our own uh, membership payments and all, all the other merchandise around the world. This broadcasting service as well, with each club would have its own channel. You'd be trying to appeal to foreign fans through it. Um, and also, it's a way of, I, I talked to you about it a little bit, mentioned it to you, you're an actor. I talked about uh, music and film and, and comedy as well. There's a way of using this digital broadcasting service to actually highlight our great culture. What we do best in Britain is, is for me, is football, music and comedy. We can combine that. We're also good at getting fucked. Let's, let's get everyone else fucked around the world on beer. So it's a case of like taking our culture and shaping our culture the way we want it to be shaped. But let's go back. I've gone on my ADHD rant here when we're going back to the regulation. So basically, this is the model. You have three, 30 players inside a wage cap that's very high and three outside it. It's fluid. It could be two, it could be five. So let's just say it's five. You've got a 35-man squad, five players. Um, oh, I'll go back to my mall, three. <laughs> 33 players, three outside the wage cap. Times that by 20, that's 60 world-class signings across the Premier League. We could easily afford a million pound a week. But then you've got to tie clubs to locality. So I've said the homegrown rule. Every club has got to field two players who were born in their area under the age of 22. If you do it like that, you can also keep squad bills lower because you don't need to pay your kids as much. So you, it gives you room for bigger contracts inside that wage cap as well. So the idea is this, each club, the bigger ones have got a spending advantage, but we need Man United and Liverpool to do well because everyone supports them around the world. But you've got to kind of develop this competition whereby it's fair, the big clubs are still doing well, but anyone could still win it. If you've got 60 world-class players across the board, that's incredible. And then the bigger clubs will have those extra players as well. And... Like I said, it's a fluid concept with the homegrown rule. Could it be one player? Could it be three? Could it be four? Under the age of 23. But they've got to be born in your area. So you can't rehouse... You can rehouse a kid at 12, but they ain't under the homegrown rule. So you've got to tie teams to locality and you've got to attract that world-class talent. I think that's the best way to do it. I think we need to think about not who wins the league, but how many points wins the league. If you can get a Premier League competition where 70 wins it, and 45 seeds you relegated, that's special. Mm. And it's full of world-class players, and it's full of um, English kids, English young players. It's a mix of uh, elite talent and homegrown lads. And there's a few of those 30, 40, 50 million players in there as well. If you can get that, and we can get our stadiums bouncing with the people that should be, and we all know people that can't get in, it's not a working-class sport anymore. We've got to reverse that. It's, it's a way of thinking differently about the philosophical foundations of what, English football should be because no one's looking. We'll go back to what I said at the start. No one's looking at it. Who are, and I, I could just say to the, every everybody listening today, what do you want? That's what I've decided. What do I want? I've written a book about it. I've spoke to various political experts. The publishing company has been a big thing. This is full of expert opinion. Kieran Maguire, Price of Football, the probably the leading financial expert. He's worked on me with it for two years. Nick Harris, he's hot on the tail of City. He's a great journalist. He helped me with the broadcasting model. So I've had a lot. This is this is not just some guy that's writing a shitty book. I've spent three years, day and night. You know, people say to me, where have you, you're not writing any songs. I've been day and night on this. I've been working in the shadows. It's taken everything out of me. Um, but I, I can't believe how good the idea is. It keeps getting better. Better and better and better, and it, the the theory is it's tangible. It's there. It sounds it. It sounds. It, but then here's here's my question, and this is probably something that I'm I'm sure you're hoping will develop over time. But how likely is this to ever happen? How much desire is there for this in the wider football world? I I had a thought a few years ago that popped into my head where f- football and its money is so ludicrous. We could just all everyone could just decide just to knock two zeros off of everything at the end of wages. 
um, transfer fees and everything would be brought back into line a little bit. It's never going to happen because that would require everybody to come together for it. So in your in your mind and in, in like a forecast, forecast kind of prediction for yourself, how likely, how much desire is there for this? I think the desire, the desire is definitely there. I think I feel the, like there's I, public desire for it. Probably, yeah. It's, the likeliness is is a different question. I was yeah. going to say it's how it's how you you essentially need people in government to sign up for something like this, though, don't you? There's already people in government that I'm talking to. I so, don't get I don't get the impression from Starmer's Labour though that it's, no, it's no. a it's a it's not particularly left. It's further left than we have been in the, for the last fifteen years, but it's not it's not by any stretch a left wing government. He's a neoliberal. Say. So it basically, people don't know what neoliberalism is. It's, it, it, it certainly doesn't support right-wing values and it doesn't support left-wing values. You ask a right-winger if they're winning, they'll say no. You ask a left-winger if they're winning, they'll say no. So who is winning? No one's winning. We've got a reverse engineer neoliberalism and, we, and the football sector is very vulnerable. We can just ring-fence it and we can just change it. In terms of how likely it is, like I said, it, this could take 10 years or 15 years or it could take four. But football... Is a, is a petri dish because it's a very interconnected network of, I don't know, 10, 15 million people who all, who all communicate really regularly. My plan is this. This is the first time I've done it, you know, and, and it should be done in Leeds because I'm Leeds and this book is it's, it's very Leeds book. And despite the, we're talking about a wider cultural phenomenon that is English football, it's a, it, it's a very Leeds book. I'm going to go to every single club. I've made it my mission. The likeliness is it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think nothing can be done and cynicism doesn't change anything. I'm not, I didn't come on here to moan about the state of the game. I came here to give you new ideas. That's exactly what we need. I'm going to go to a hundred clubs and go on their equivalent of the square ball. Let's see if I can do it. But this is a social experiment in a time where we desperately need new political ideas. And I'm standing by the idea, the, the, the claim, this is the best political idea of the century. If I'm right about that, why can't this happen? I, I, before the social experiment, you've got to have the theory. The theory is there. It's watertight. Can I ask, I can ask how it, you see it working further down the pyramid? Because obviously there's, at the moment in football, because of, partly because of what you've described, of the inequality of the structure of it, the money yeah. is all at the top. The overseas memberships, all that sort of stuff, you can see how that works for Liverpool, for Man United, for Leeds. If you're Rochdale or Harrogate Town, how do you... Where does your money come from, essentially? Where, how does this work as it, as it drops down the pyramid and the teams become far more, far more local? Yeah, the, the structure that I've done goes down to the 10th tier of the pyramid. So it's a complete wage cap on, on everything. Mm -hmm. No club spends money on wages they get given it. And you also get given extra money to spend off the pitch. So it's a way of using footballs. We're talking tens of billions of pounds here. It's a way of devolving economic power. It's, it, we're going to follow the rule of subsidiary, which means all economic decisions go to the lowest level possible. So basically the idea is this. You'll get given, you could be Harrogate Town, yeah? You'll get given X amount for wages. Also the homegrown rule, the, the wages will be upped. The, the, the art of playing football is incredible. <clears throat> and the people who make it as professionals are incredible. You're the best at the best spot in the world, the most popular spot in the world. You've got to, you've got to up the wages. Uh, these people, and the, the idea that they go around and go on the piss is just it's changed. You know, these are top athletes. So that you've got to have maybe four or five players on the homegrown rule lower down because we'll, we'll be able to afford foreign, you know, decent League One players. Uh, when I say League One, I mean French League One down in the third tier. You know, because that's how much we'll be, we'll be paying more than a lot of to Europe's top leagues in our fourth tier. So you've got a low tight to locality, but the club, the tens of billions that have been earned through the broadcasting model, you, you spend about, I think I've spent 11 billion on wages. I've also interwoven it with the, with the education sector. So each player gets, like in, the, in America, you get given, all the football players, they get given college degrees and coaching. That's what we should do. We should, we basically, we, we can teach kids how to teach. You know, so most players don't make it. Most kids, it's, it's somewhat like one in a thousand and they're just thrown on a fucking scrap heap. But so you've got to give them skills and I, honestly, I can't even begin to describe to you how how these will, how how much is going to bring society together and how much money, I'll go back to Harrogate Town. They'll be given loads of money 
uh, for the players, wage cap, everyone's spending the same, and they'll be given, I think it's about five million to spend off the pitch. So in a place like Harrogate, that could go a long way. And you're getting it every single year. The top 100 clubs, because I've, I've done five leagues of 20, why why we've got 24 in one league, it doesn't, it's not logical. But the top 100 will get uh, five million each. So it's really egalitarian. Man City will get five million. Harrogate Town will get five million. But the idea is that when broadcasting first came into football in 1965, every, it was a shared between the 92 clubs. So it's the idea that this is sport, it's egalitarian. We all get given loads of money. We all decide on what to do with it. You're a member of Harrogate Town. You've got £5 million to spend. How do you want to spend it? It's up to you. The football's all taken care of. And you've also got your own commercial gains as well. The idea is that everyone's taken care of. It, it, you, we're using football to spread money throughout the economy and throughout the nation. It's very London-centric. Is, is the look at, look at HS2. It's a, it's a railway line from Birmingham to London. It's shaving 15 minutes off the journey. It's costing us £70 billion. That money is better off spent connecting Manchester Sheffield. I mean, or, you know, these connections don't fucking exist at the minute. It's ridiculous. So the idea is that we can reverse the London-centric on the, that southeast kind of where all the money is because when you look at football, a reversal of the southeast, it's the northwest where most of the money will go because... Basically, these clubs, Man United could be looking at, you know, three, four, five billion a year coming in that's spare. Man City as well. It's a two-club city. The same for Liverpool. We've got power through the common association to lobby central government. You can start to turn around and say, listen, in five years, we'll put in three billion a year. You put in three billion a year. You've got yourself an under tube, underground tube system in Manchester. Same for Liverpool. We should be looking to do that now. They, you know, the way that this country's been run, it's been terrible. There's, there's, Newcastle have got an underground, haven't they, in the metro system, but it's only in London and Newcastle, in the sixth richest country in the world. The, the transport in this in this city, of, if you don't live in Leeds and you're listening, fucking hell, don't come, it's fucked. <laughs> you can't get anywhere. Getting down here on the uh, on the gyrator, it, you know, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. By the way, go in the right lane, go right round the directory and fucking go off there. Don't, don't fuck about in that traffic. <laughs> so, but th this would mean, surely, that we would need complete... It, it would need tearing up as far as who is looking after the football club because they would have to have an invested interest in the locality and also... Yeah, we'd decide a, for ourselves. The, yeah. uh, it, basically, the model of ownership is up for grabs. It's creative. How do you want to run your football club? Hmm. You could you could even do, we'll, we'll pick the team. You are the owners. I mean, it'd be really chaotic. I think that models will come about and then people will go, well, that's how you do it. Because democracy causes problems. It's not without bumps in the road. But these are nice problems to have. The idea of the logistically keeping a company with 20 million members together... But, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of logistical challenges, but this is a nice problem to have. Communication technology, you can do online referendums, you know, you can decide things. This is about democracy. And how, I mean, how often do you want to have elections? Every five years? Every year? You know, you've got... What we should do is write a constitution. We need to write... And each club will probably have their own as well, but we need to write a constitution of how English football should be governed. I've stuck to two principles because it's hard to write a constitution. You know, everyone has the right to bear arms. You know, I don't even know how, they, how you write them, but I've just said English football should be managed in a way that benefits Britain and her people. And two, you've got to protect and enhance English football as a dominant brand globally. Because I think if you can do that, we can have a something that works for everybody and we can keep the profits coming in. Why have you taken this upon yourself? There's a question. Um, Three years ago, before you put pen to paper or opened your laptop. There's a lot of reasons, actually. Part of it's, like I said, Bielsa. Hmm. Gonna, because everything that you're talking about comes back to, for me, how he changed yeah. at Leeds United and its fans uh, um, to, to see football for maybe what it is or what it could be. Yeah, I think you've got it. I think you've said it there for what it is and what it could be. Bielsa changed everything for me. You know, it was a really bad time for me when Bielsa came because I'd just got on the final of Britain's Got Talent and totally messed it up. And it's um, it's really damaging because it's 15 million people. I'm massive. I'm, I, I'd messed it up and I, I was gutted. I wasn't sleeping, you know. And I was... Um, the only person who really knew about it was my partner, Rach, because she was living with me. And I, I was absolutely gutted. And then Bielsa came. And it just changed my life. I, 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 and I, I did the Bielsa Rhapsody not long after. And that kind of like, it, it, it really saved my mental health because I'd gone from hating myself to 
been really adored by all the Leeds fan base for writing this song. And I was like, it, it changed my life. And I was just sucked into the, you know, it's not a myth, but the Bielsa myth, if you want to call it that. And just, I just lived it. I lived it day and night. And when he left, I just kept it going. I began this project and it's a case of optimism. You know, I, I want to change the world. This is about changing the fucking world, mate. Oh, I'm taking it on. You know, like, that's more Leeds United than anything. Mm. Fucking come on. And if Leeds don't accept it, I'll fucking take it somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fascinating. Where do you think the football regulator fits into this? Don't, don't, listen. Because Angus Kinnear is very much against don't, we've got the a regulator. Water, we've got a water regulator. Regulators don't regulate. And that's why the rivers are nice and clean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, it's bullshit. You've got to change everything. I mean, at, at every football club, the way that the people who own our clubs, cut yourself away. Don't negotiate with them. You don't need to. We are, we are so humiliated. We can't see it. I see the humiliation. And I'm turning around and saying, I'm not being humiliated anymore. I'm not negotiating with a bunch of neoliberals or a bunch of neoliberal sympathisers. I'm taking you on and we can take them on together. Don't listen to anything that the FA, the Premier League, the EFL or any club owners say. Don't listen to any of it. It's bullshit. What do you want football to be? Let's go make it happen. Fucking, I found that. I found that. Liam Gallagher's come back as well. It's this away. <laughs> it's, 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 that, it's that rock and roll. That don't, don't be humiliated. Let's go for it. Let's just, what do you want football to be? And that's, you know, at the very least, that's an interesting question because no one's ever asked you. Go away and think about it and then let's make it happen because it's about deciding. I can't speak for the collective. All I can do is turn around and say, it's time to fight back. I think there is an extent to which we're collectively blinded by the, at least superficially, the success of English football. Because you can go, mm. you can to contrast to 1983 as a turning point, you can go like, well, since then we have got all the best players and look at the stadiums compared to then. So you can, there are certain elements that you can say legitimately have been very successful. Absolutely. But at the same time, as a Leeds fan, you go, well, we want to get up and there's, fuck all chance of us ever winning no, the Premier no, no, League. That, that, yeah, yeah there's, that, that's all gone now. Leeds United as it was is dead. English football as it was is dead. But like you said, there are facets of globalisation that are really beneficial. And one of them is 200 million people paying for our products. So if it ain't broke, you know, if it, it don't, uh, what, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's the one. Listen, what, what the Premier League have done commercially, build on it. Don't, uh, you, you're not bound by it. And if you think, oh, if we change what we're doing with new intellectual foundations, I mean, a fan takeover would be fantastic for the rest of the world. They'd be absolutely, they'd be by, we can expand this product. We can grow this product because it, yeah, you know, I, I do think psychologically at a subconscious level, we feel like if we change things, we'll have a shit league. Mm. It's not the case. We can, the, uh, our football is fast paced. Uh, a lot to do with climate. It's exciting. We've got globally revered clubs. As long as we've got world-class players, and you know what? The the, the products that, that foreigners are seeing, it's not us. It's not us. You know, you go to a stadium, you can see it. You, you look online on social media, it's, it's like a ghost town in there now with the big clubs. Mm. We, we, are, we, we are changing. We are changing. We're becoming soft. We're becoming commercialised, consumer zombies. We're not active football fans the spirit the football is growing, but the spiritual kind of element of it's been diluted. It's a, it's it's chance that this spiritual element that we have of English football and culture is a great selling point. There's it's so, a great commercial product in itself. We can expand this business. There's there's so much of of Bielsa and what he stood for. And yeah, stood, I, I honestly think it's a bit of a pipe dream. I mean, I've I've called it, uh, but I think Bielsa would I'd want him to read it one day. I think I think he sat there looking at us. I mean, we've all got the, you know, Bielsa memorabilia still going on. I, mean, I think this is what I I wrote it for him in many ways. I think this is the model. He's always talked about football is for the fans. This is how you do it. But it, it requires big, bold, systemic change. It requires positive attitude and a can-do attitude. And I've got to convince, I reckon, about 10 million people that, to you know, we're very politically passive. We, we, we just, cynicism does not change anything. It's actually, psychologically, it's a begrudging allegiance with the system. By complaining about it, you absolve yourself of responsibility for doing anything about it. 
So that's the that's the battle I've got to take on. I've got to persuade people to fucking act. Let's go. Come on. And so this is your first battle cry. You so say you're going to go and try and find um, 99 other football podcasts that you that's can it. go and shout about. So to our listeners, to those watching on YouTube, why should they pre-order? Why should they go and buy this book? First of all, pre-order is a massive for a book success. If you get a lot of pre-orders, then success breeds success. If you like the idea of what I'm saying, pre-order the book. It's out on December the 2nd. Um, we've got the Amazon link. I've sent it to you, Michael. So I, I don't know. Link we'll in the bio. In the description. Thing. Yeah. However, yeah. Yeah, some people can't do that. So <laughs> if you, I can't do, you know, it says link in the bio or link in the, I can't do that. So if you can't do that, say something and we'll make it up and we'll get you to the link. It's really important that um, we get as many pre-orders as we can. This book is going to change the way you think. I, it's a bit like, I'm hoping it's that red pill that Neo takes in the Matrix you know, where you, you can't go back. Once you read this book, you'll understand the process of what's happened to English football, a new political model that is, like I said, quantum politics, left, right as well. But oh, by the way, I've not mentioned this, Brexit is advantageous. Yeah, this is how we use Brexit. So inside the EU, what I'm suggesting isn't possible because of the EU liberalisation laws. You can't get state-owned monopolies the, the, it's very neoliberal, the economic structure of the EU. They want uh, free market principles. So this is illegal inside the EU. If we tried to do it, we could try to do it. It'd be a very messy, drawn-out affair because dispossessed claimants would, apply, would, would claim to the European courts. All that bureaucracy, all that red tape's gone. This is how you use Brexit. The English, we are kicking out the unelected foreigners. This is literally Brexit on speed. There's got to be some benefit to Brexit. And if this, this is, is it, it then... this is how you do it. What we can do is ring fence football. I'm not talking about the why. I'm not to even talking about nationalising war or anything else. Let's nationalise football, start there, reverse engineer neoliberal economic practice as an experiment and see what happens. Because I'm telling you now, it'll be fucking brilliant. We'll have loads of money, loads of democracy and self-respect. We have got no self-respect in the footballing English culture, none. You look at Germany... They don't take this shit. They're always um, they're always upsetting the apple cart in terms of the, the governance of German football. It's in their hands. They just turned down a massive deal with a broadcaster. 800 million it was worth. They fucked it off. They, they, how did they do it? They, they had loads of protests uh, outside. They had, they had smoke bombs on pitches. They stopped games happening. They do not fuck about. They've got loads of... Um, the UNES, oh, I can't say it, but it's um, they've got 50 plus one stays. It's a, and these are organisations across German fandom. And they've got you say curve. I can't say, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's similar. It's about looking after German football and culture. We don't have that here. We're separated from each other. And, you know, you look at things like Mike Ashley and, and Glazers. People are fighting their own club's battle. We had it too. But what we don't realise is we're all fighting the same war. We're just yet to fucking realise it. And so this, for you, this this book is about optimism. It's about change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's about on the front foot, don't take any more shit. Let's go. Right, I think we'll um, we'll close that off there. Um, pre-order link, massively, massively important. Listen, this is the first time we've done it. I need 2,000 yeah. pre-orders. The book, the, the, the rights are owned by the publishing company. I need 2,000 pre-orders to get an audio version of the book. And I want to say this qu quickly because people can't read books anymore. In a world of TikTok viral videos, it's really cathartic. If you've not read a book in ages, I am telling you now, you're not staring at a screen, you're taking the information in at your own pace, and it's rewarding. And instead of chasing those da dopamine hits, scrolling down, you know, let's read this book. It'll be, I mean, I, know, I don't want to sound patronising, but I found it, I, I thought in lockdown, I thought, I'll start trying to read more, you know, and that's part of the reason why the book ended up being written. I've had to, I counted the books actually, it's about, it's, I think it's 38 books I've read to write this book. So, uh, and there's a lot of online articles as well and stuff like that. It's real effort of reading it and it, 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 it's great for your mental health and um, I think, I, I'm, I, <laughs> no one's read the book. I've not, only people in the public stream company have read it and they're really excited about it. So I don't know how good it is. I well, can't, I've sent it to Michael, but it's a PDF file. They you will soon. You don't read PDF files. It's, it's not too long. It's 60,000 words. It's about 200 pages. The font in that small. It's okay. Let's go. Honestly, this, this book is no pictures. Sorry. 
<laughs> but there are, but it does say like part one, yeah, and then it, and that's a full page, and there's a blank page. So you get through it quicker than you think. You know what I mean? <laughs> there you go. Um, so this is football. The people shame how to revolutionise national sport by Mickey P. Kerr. Um, just to touch on it again, it's about optimism, it's about change. Um, thank you, uh, Mickey, for coming in to talk to us. It's really an honour to be here because I've you know watched this table so many times on on YouTube and stuff. So and um, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. No worries. We'll speak to you guys later. Thank you so much. The Square Ball Podcast.